I'm so glad that technology isn't perfect, aren't you? I'm Sandy Morgan, and um, I am uh, welcoming, I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Rock Ethics Institute. Um, and uh, just want to say a couple of quick things. I, I hope that you, if you are, are not a frequent flyer of this uh, speaker series, that you will pick up the posters and put them up on your door and encourage people to come. We have three more fabulous speakers coming, uh, one in February, one in March, and one in April, and I hope we'll be able to see you there. I also have a lot of people to thank. Um, aside from all the, the uh, people here at the Rock Ethics Institute who make this possible, there's quite a few departments and donors who have contributed to this. They include the Richard B. Lippin and late Ronnie Lippin, um, well, those people, the Africana Research Center, the Department of African and African American Studies, the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations, the Department of Psychology and Sociology, Women's Studies, and the University Libraries. And the Rock Institute, in a larger way, is funded through the generosity of, uh, of a gift from Doug and Julie Rock. So we thank all of the departments and the, the, the individuals that um, brought our speakers here and are, are allowing us over the course of this year to explore uh, the concept, the, the idea of economic justice through a variety of different lenses. Um, I am very particularly honored today to be able to introduce to you Joan Acker, who is a very distinguished scholar who I will tell you about in a moment, but she's also a very dear friend and collaborator. And it's, it's always great when when you can put all these th those things together in one person. Um, Joan, who's going to be talking on the uh, very interesting topic is ethical capitalism and oxymoron, um, came to sociology as a second career for uh, 13 years from 1948 to 1961. She was a social worker, a medical social worker trained at the University of Chicago. Um, and for a variety of reasons, she decided to enter the field of sociology in uh, the early 1960s. And she got her PhD at the University of Oregon in 1967 and has been professor emeritus there since 1994. Um, Joan has, over the course of her long career, done a whole variety of research projects, both in the United States and in Scandinavia. Uh, I'm not going to go through what all of them are. But they've resulted in a wide variety of uh, journal articles in uh, the top journals in three different fields, women's studies, sociology, and the study of organizations, including the American Journal of Sociology, Gender and Society, Signs, Gender Work and Organizations, and others. Uh, her first book was published in 1989, and it's called Doing Comparable Worth. And that was the result of a three-year project uh, that she was on as both a researcher and um, kind of implementer advocate to develop uh, a scheme for doing uh, comparable worth pay equity in Oregon, and that was in the early 1980s. Joan was the founding director of the Center for the Study of Women and Society at the University of Oregon, uh, uh, an organization that's dear to my heart because I followed her, um, not directly, but pretty close to directly, and, and ran that center for 15 years. And the reason I wanted to do that was because of the amazing start that she gave it. Um, it was, it's a very, a very interesting um, story that we won't go into today, but it was one of the very first of the women's research centers in the country. Um, Joan has not, she, lots of people know Joan, and lots of people uh, see her as a mentor as a source of tremendous intellectual wisdom. Um, and she's been highly recognized, not just by lots of individuals, but by her 
uh, professional association. She's won two of the most important awards that the American Sociological Association gives. In 1984, the Jesse Bernard Award for Contributions to Feminist Sociology, and then the Distinguished Career Award in 1994. So you are in for a treat. Um, she brings to us truly two careers worth of knowledge about the topic that she's talking about. Um, a recent book that I should mention before I put her here, um, uh, Class Questions, um, Feminist Answers that just came out this year is, um, is a, a amazing synthesis of a lot of the work that she's done and of the work a lot of other people have done. And you'll get a little taste of it today because she's gonna, her lecture will be coming from some of the chapters of that book and some new thoughts, I'm sure. So join me in welcoming Joan Acker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. It's really uh, very special to be here uh, at the Rock Institute. And I must say that uh, uh, knowing that the Rocks gave all this money for the study of ethics, uh, almost leads me to say, oh, it's not an oxymoron, ethical capitalism. But wait, <laughs> that is not really what I'm going to argue with you today. <laughs> uh, now, as Sandy has indicated, um, my work has been very much located in the exciting, maybe it's not exciting anymore, but it was very exciting development of feminist sociology, and then gender in a whole range of fields, intellectual fields. And uh, my talk today is rooted in that perspective. And what it specifically comes out of is my attempt to understand how gender is built into the structures and processes of capitalism uh, or capitalist societies. Uh, and as I will emphasize over and over again, um, my view is that this is highly variable. There's not one capitalism, and there certainly is not one way that gender uh, relations are embedded in capitalist processes. It's not an easy thing to argue, or at least it hasn't been terribly easy for me, partly because gender tends to become very invisible in an economic world that pretends to be neutral on all kinds of grounds. But uh, from my point of view and that of many people, it's not. Okay. <laughs> What, what am I not doing? Where's my media guy? Oh, okay. No. Is that my second one? Oh, okay. All right. Got it, got it. I'm, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, so you just have to put up with me. Okay. Is ethic, uh, ethical capitalism an oxymoron? Is it a contradiction in terms? And what I want to... Uh, argue that you can look at it either way and say that ethical ca capitalism is not an oxymoron. As a matter of fact, uh, um, some of the, um, uh, m many of the central theorists in economics today would say that it's not an oxymoron, that uh, given that the only responsibility of capitalist firms is to their shareholders, or perhaps some other limited list of stakeholders, um, that as long as they carry out that responsibility, uh, capitalist firms, capitalist organizations are not, um, uh, are ethical according to their standards. There is a very, very long tradition, however, arguing that uh, in essence, ethical capitalism is an oxymoron. That it's a system that fundamentally is exploitative, um, damaging, uh, steals from people the fruits of their labor, and does not reward them adequately. Disposes of labor as it feels, uh, well, as the owners of capital feel is uh, 
advantageous to them. So, I'm going to try to click to another. Uh, now, first of all, um, I want to recognize that the long tradition, I think I have skipped a slide here. Okay. Uh, the long tradition uh, that says that you cannot have an ethic capitalism. It just does not exist. Of course, um, doesn't necessarily start with, but some of the most prominent uh, contenders from that point of view were Marx and Engels and all their very long series of followers. And um, other kinds of authors who would make the same claim from different points of view, one of my favorites being Karl Polanyi, um, and uh, various socialist traditions, radical traditions of other kinds, including, I think, many socialist feminists of the 1970s and early 1980s. Now, I want to argue that both the traditional and the, when I turn away, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, uh, that both the traditional, that is the traditional, econ what we see as traditional economics right now, okay, um, now of neoliberal economics, and the radical analysts are inadequate. Their view of what is economy is too narrow. They look only at the monetary economy and not at the non-monetary economy, as many feminist uh, economists and others have pointed out. They fail to examine unpaid reproduction, work in the home. Uh, they fail to, ex uh, to examine adequately um, uh, subsistence production, the garden, the fields. And of course, they miss then much of the work of third world women in those countries that have not completely be been uh, converted to uh, industrial production and uh, where people are still struggling on the land. The result is, as I say here, that the work of women in particular is often excluded from the analysis of capitalism and from the notion of what is the economy. And this is true for our countries and, as I said, for other countries where the uh, uh, transition is from the old forms of agricultural production has not been completely uh, achieved. Okay. Uh, this, there's something wrong here. Just give me a second here. Oh, I've got it now. I think I'm okay. I just fe felt maybe we're, it was skipping, and I see how I organized this. It was me that was skipping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say yes. Uh, ethical capitalism is an oxymoron, and do it from a feminist point of view. I argue that um, capitalist organizations and let me say here that I want to keep this discussion primarily at the level of organizations. So to look at what are, is actually being done, how are capitalist relations actually being organized and um, becoming part of everyday life. So capitalist organizations fail to take responsibility for provisioning human life and supporting its reproduction. This is an overview of the argument. This failure is rooted in the underlying gendered separations between production and reproduction. S seeing reproduction as a very uh, loose term uh, for all the kinds of things that go into bearing children, raising children, feeding families, um, 
getting ready for the next day, etc. Corporations then deal with this failure very often through claims to non-responsibility, refusing to take responsibility for the activities and uh, provisioning that they see as outside their realm. First, I want to do a few definitions here. Um, obviously, from the way I've been talking, economic activity is uh, defined in my per perspective as processes that provide social provisioning and ensure human survival. It's how societies organize to produce and reproduce material life. And so the study of economics is the study of provisioning. I see this as a broader kind of definition than the definition of economic life as primarily focusing on monetary relationships. And it allows us then to look at a lot of different societies using the same overall perspective on what is economic activity. And also, it is a view from the bottom up rather than a view from the top, rather than starting with the way capitalism organizes finances and uh, finance capital and production at a global level or even a national corporate level. We start with, well, how's, how's everyday life? How are people getting their provisions in everyday life? And I understand you have read something on social provisioning, right? Some people have here. Yeah. Capitalism, then, is a form, the present form, of organizing much economic activity. And its aim is not social provisioning, unless social provisioning produces profit. Um, and profit is usually produced through market processes. More and more, to survive, we need money in this system. It is a money system, of course. And for most of us, money only comes through working for an employer. Somehow, we have to get money. Of course, if we can't get a job, we can always deal drugs. Uh, although some of us are probably better at that than others. Um, um, I don't think I'd be very good, but maybe, maybe I would. Yeah. Um, control over the means of provisioning, then, is highly centralized and privately owned. Most of us do not control our own means of provisioning. Um, Although self-provisioning still does exist, even in our society. When Sandy and I did our study of welfare uh, restructuring, for example, some of the women we interviewed were still involved in self-provisioning. They had great big gardens, usually with other members of their family, and they grew a lot of stuff, and they canned it, and they, well, mostly they froze it. Uh, and um, uh, they were really partly dependent on self-provisioning, but not many of us do that anymore. The final point, of course, you all know, but I think it is important uh, that um, um, the organization of capitalist production is not democratic. It's rather autocratic, and uh, most of us have almost no nothing to say about how the organization actually is put together and functions. All we hope is we have a little to, bit to say over what kind of wages we can earn. And in the US, oh, I have to tell you one other thing that's got to be a proviso here uh, uh, in my talk. I always am talking from the perspective of the United States. And the United States is not the world, even though we try to pretend it is. And uh, it's particularly a problem when I'm in Europe. Or, uh, because uh, there are different kinds of assumptions about the way things ought to be organized and controlled than we have here. So I'm talking about the US. But on the other hand, given that there are ambitions to transform the rest of the world into the US, um, maybe that's not too far off. 
Okay, what is ethics? The, you've all been discussing ethical behavior, and I did this little slide to clarify for me what I meant. Um, ethical behavior obviously applies not only to individuals, but to collectivities of human beings. And ethical economic activities then are, for me, those that further the pro provisioning of all people across class, gender, and race, ethnic divisions, and activities that preserve environmental and other necessary conditioning conditions for provisioning. Now, I would also include ethical behavior as refraining from lying, stealing, cheating, killing, etc. Right? Uh, in the course of doing business. And we all know that uh, fairly recently there's been a lot of unethical behavior um, of that kind. But I'm most interested in the ethical behavior that has to do with um, pro provisioning. Now, I, I argue, as I said, that capitalism, capitalist organizations generally claim that they're not responsible for an awful lot of provisioning. Uh, and they refuse to take responsibility or they attempt to avoid it when some other uh, voices in the society attempt to say, take some responsibility. Um, there are continual demands to capitalist organizations for responsibility and continual claims that there's no problem here, it's not my business. Uh, there is a very huge literature now on corporate social responsibility, mostly written from a business point of view. I looked at Google Scholar before I came here, and since 2002, there have been 26,000 um, references. And there's something like 15,000 references in the same period to ethical capitalism. Obviously, I was not able to read the whole uh, collection of articles. <laughs> I tried, but I'm sorry. Poor scholarship. Um, I, I dipped into some of them, and uh, what I came up with was the conclusion that this is that corporate social responsibility is seen as a big problem, a big issue. And there are various attempts to address it within the world of corporations. Um, but there is no consensus on what it is, how it should be pursued, or what the results are from any of the many efforts to uh, enact corporate social responsibility. It, it would be a very interesting area to go into to see the different kinds of um, efforts that have been made. What seems to be one of the most recent, a 205 book, I've got the citation someplace, um, that is on corporate social responsibility, comes up with the conclusion that there are almost no consequences of efforts to achieve corporate social responsibility. And maybe it's good to do, but it doesn't make business better, it doesn't make business worse. And, and part of what a lot of these efforts are uh, is to what many of these articles argue, let me put it that way, is that there is a business case for re responsibility, that your profits go up if you are responsible. And this new book um, argues that there is absolutely no evidence that your profits go up, but there's no evidence that profits go down either. It's a wash. So I hope somebody does some further work on this, but I think it's interesting that it is a, um, it is a big issue indicating to me that there are lots of demands for responsibility 
and many, many competing claims that there is no responsibility or non-responsibility. Now, there are all kinds of issues that provoke claims of non-responsibility, and I'm sure you all know about those, lots of things that have to do with workers and, and uh, demands from unions where we have them anymore, uh, demands from some government agencies. Um, we're not responsible anymore for wages. We've got to compete on a global basis. Affirmative action, pay equity have been focuses. Um, all these kinds of family issues, uh, particularly um, time off to take care of work family issues are a big thing, right? Um, there's the whole question of environmental damage, community health of various kinds, um, and so forth. You can read them. And I don't even have to tell you. All you have to do is open up the newspaper and you will see them. I opened up the newspaper the day I left to come here and I found some nice examples. Um, one is called A Long Painful Road and it points out that in spite of all the lawsuits against the tobacco companies, there has been no regulation of the use of tobacco in the United States. And um, um, I, I view that as you know, an example of the success of the claims to non-responsibility. Uh, another one, and you all know this one, report grim on global warming. And then something about how long it's taken to get anybody to come up with the, any corporations to pay any attention to that. Although now they're beginning to because there's a possibility of making profit out of um, environmentally uh, friendly uh, sources of power and so forth. And here I have another one, and there might be some disagreement about this. The headline is, for more and more young people, dollars make sense. And it is about um, uh, all those people, um, college-age adults, who say that acquiring wealth is their top goal in life. And um, then the article goes on to talk about the very high levels of luxury con consumption that uh, uh, are standards for many young people. Now, I think this may be a secondary effect of non-responsibility, which is, uh, occurs through advertising for all kinds of stuff that is not very, you know, you may need it for a sense of yourself in your social position, but uh, uh, doesn't have much to do with sustaining life for people who don't have enough to eat, uh, which is not one of the goals. Okay. So, I mentioned, I earlier said that I see an organizing understructure for non-responsibility, and that is in the division between the way families and individuals' lives are organized and the way production is organized in our society. I really want to look at aims primarily, all right? The goals of production uh, are not sustaining the lives of people unless it produces profit. So that is quite different from the goals of families, which are to sustain life, to enhance life, to bring the next generation along, uh, make sure they got enough milk and cereal and etc. Um, the way life is organized is very different too. Now this division, as we all know, I, I hope we all know, <laughs> uh, is also marked as a clear division on the basis of gender. There's a division of labor here, which amazingly continues in spite of the reduction of the division of labor in some other areas between the genders. Okay. We were just talking about this at lunch, that um, women are still doing the housework and the childcare and 
many of the other tasks that they have done for generations, uh, while also earning money in the paid labor force. So I, I think this is often, or most of the time, very invisible to most of us. But this division supports, then, the claim that capitalist organizations that produce the material and many of the services, the material life and many of the services now, really don't have any responsibility for this sector of the world over here, which is where the unpaid work is done and is just simply assumed to be done. And actually, the work family pro programs, and we have many of them um, in various corporations. They, they never really go any further than saying, we'll make it a little bit easier for you to take time off from your paid work. We're not going to, there's no program, no approach to support in any great degree the unpaid work that women do. And of course, some men are doing it now, too. I think it's necessary to recognize that. But there's a whole level area of work in our society that's very necessary for capitalism that is non-rewarded and non-supported. And let me just say a couple of things about why, if you haven't already read the great amount of literature on this, why the unpaid work is necessary. The unpaid work is necessary in order to, in old style socialist feminist terms, reproduce the labor force, send people back out to work, and to uh, raise the next generation, and also to consume. There's a huge amount of work that goes into all of this. Um, that if, if we would all say, no more consuming except the very absolute essentials. It would be tough uh, on many uh, profit-making organizations. OK. Now, there are many strategies for dealing with uh, uh, non-responsibility. And uh, this is the other side of what I see as an ongoing dynamic between capitalist organizations and many, many other organizing um, efforts in the society. We have legislation on corporate behavior. We have union organizing, welfare state programs, lots of social movements. We have the unpaid caring work and self-provisioning, mostly by women. And we have this corporate initiatives, work family issues. Um, just to highlight the variability I want to tell you that the week that something called the Work Family Institute, located in New York, was giving awards to Xerox and a couple of other very big firms for their wonderful work on work family relations, uh, Walmart was initiating work rules and policies that were going to make it much, much more difficult for people with family responsibilities to work at Walmart. And the ostensible reason for this, not the one Walmart would claim, the reason was to encourage people to quit who had been there for a while so that they could reduce, hire younger people at lower wages. So one of the things they were doing is demanding that their employees be available 24 hours a day for scheduling with no guarantee of future scheduling. So obviously, right, you have kids. You can't be available 24 hours a day, or it's very, very difficult. And um, there were other kinds of uh, initiatives Walmart was taking. So it, you can have your high-end, really profitable corporations giving some work family stuff to particularly their administrative, their management levels not very often to their workers, OK? But um, then, then you have uh, big organizations like Walmart 
that are in the in, in the interest of reducing their costs and instituting rules that make it almost impossible for people with families to work there. Okay, why do we have corporate? Um, uh, why do, why do they give in sometimes and uh, become more responsible? Sometimes it is to secure or retain a labor force. And there are many examples of this. When um, it's hard to get the desired labor, um, corporations will institute uh, some kinds of responsible behavior towards those employees. To retain or gain customers sometimes. A big one is civil disorder. Uh, the only reason, or the primary reason, I think, that we ever got the Social Security Act with our retirement pensions and our unemployment compensations is the civil disorder of the 1930s, when it really looked as though the U.S. society was collapsing in some very bad ways. So if, if you want to force corporate responsibility, I recommend civil disorder. <laughs> but also, to maintain and achieve legitimacy is a big uh, motivator. And that's why we have Xerox doing what it does and, and um, other companies trying to be environmentally friendly and, and nice to their workers. But of course, we see it pretty much uh, uh, disappearing today uh, because of various changes I'm going to talk about. Okay. I think that um, we have a rather specially high degree of corporate non-responsibility in the United States. And that since uh, the restoration of a neoliberal approach to the economy that, of course, is hard to date, but let's say most people have dated uh, with the election of Reagan in 1980, uh, that there has been a, uh, a tremendous restoration of non-responsibility. And there are uh, various ways this has been done, as I list here, by reducing or not increasing wages. Um, one of the main reasons, at least according to some things I read, or one of the main ways of increasing profits is to reduce wages. Uh, reducing job security and flexibility and protections called flexibility. Uh, increasing flexibility is a way of increasing uh, non-responsibility. Downsizing and offshoring. While cutting the social safety net is a very large way of doing it. Uh, and the, our social safety net in general in the United States has been cut and cut and cut. It's not just the so-called reform of welfare, but unemployment compensation has been cut. Um, health, uh, food stamps have been cut. We all know about the health care crisis and the inability of many corporations, and it's justifiable to provide health care, et cetera. And I say U.S. exceptionalism here because uh, I'm convinced that at least up until now, the other wealthy capitalist nations have not gone nearly as far in uh, restoring non-responsibility. My friends in Europe can't understand how I can stand it here any longer. With my point of view, I have to, I've got a point of view, it's very, very clear. Okay. Now, I will argue then that with what the so-called globalization, which is a term that needs a great deal of discussion and, uh, you know, amendment, and non-responsibility has increased, and that it is built into global processes. If you, as with Nike, for example, do not own any of the factories that actually make your product, you have no responsibility to those workers. Only when there's a global movement to try and force Nike 
and other corporations to do something, do they kind of go through the motions? And I say kind of. Uh, because while those corporations are going through the motions, um, the, they are also demanding lower prices from the suppliers. So it's very difficult in those factories in other countries to live up to the demands for responsibility towards workers when they're under the factories under all this pressure from the US to lower and lower and lower the prices. OK. Um, I, I've already talked about the other two items here. And I, I like it that it's a win-win situation for non-responsibility. And perhaps one of, that is one of the main reasons for globalization. Uh, can capitalism become ethical? I think it's highly unlikely today in the US. But I wouldn't say that uh, it's, I'm not sure I have to say it's an oxymoron. It's totally impossible. We see that very strong welfare states, fairly strong welfare states, are still strong capitalist states. Um, some organizations are taking action on some um, issues when they have to or when it's in their interests. There's a lot that could be done legislatively to reduce the power of corporations. Um, changing state laws that essentially um, demand that corporations first take care of the interests of their shareholders. Oh, well, those laws could be changed. Some people are saying, well, small local business uh, might be much more responsive to community needs. I, I'm not so sure small local business is often in very difficult situations economically. Um, I think long term, we need a very substantial change in the economy aimed at provisioning. I myself would like to see economic organization that first of all is focused on provisioning all people, taking care of problems of poverty and inequality, for example. It's not clear how that would be achieved or what that organization would look like, but at least it's not clear to me. Um, I understand that there is an agenda being put out by the Economic Policy Institute now for lots of changes uh, in a very positive direction in terms of provisioning ordinary people. But <laughs> my view, and I'll end here, that um, big troubles may be the condition that is necessary, the necessary condition for either very much altering the way capitalist organizations function now or altering the system altogether. But we, a big lack, uh, I, th I think, generally, among people who are very concerned about this, is a really concrete vision of what that alteration would look like. Uh, in the meantime, maybe small steps to control here and there uh, the non-responsibility of corporations is politically what's possible now. Thank you very much. So what do we do now? Oh, you take over. <laughs> OK. I'm going to try and get rid of this. Is this one on? This one's on. OK. Since we're webcasting, we do ask that when you have a question that you just raise your hand and I'll bring you this so we can hear you on the, the uh... 
Well, thank you. I uh, appreciated your discussion, but I have a, a question for you. Given sure. that, uh, and I appreciated your statement, if you want to achieve social responsibility, I recommend civil disorder. Uh, given that, Exactly. So what do you see as a responsibility of intellectuals, of students and professors, especially at an, a university such as this, which works very closely with such uh, capitalist organizations, in fact, hand in glove with them, and which takes great efforts through its uh, officers and personnel, for instance, the vice president for research, to crush any attempt at unionization on the part of its graduate assistants, uh, let alone faculty? Yeah. Well, I think we're obviously okay. we're obviously in a very difficult situation these days. Um, there are no, as far as I can see, there are no powerful social movements outside of the organizations, organizations such as this one, such as my university, and so forth, to give uh, support uh, to efforts inside uh, to change. And I'll go back. I'll go back to the what I think faculty can do. Um, I think it would be much easier for faculty to include in education ideas such as this, and I'm sure they, that some faculty do here. Um, but it would be much easier if there were also pressures from other places in the society to to do that. So it was much easier to be an academic radical in the 70s, I think, uh, than it is today. Um, and you bring up a very good point that many organizations that are not uh, capitalist producing organizations are still funded very much from that sector, like this university. Unfortunately, my university, while it has some funding, is not nearly as rich as this place. Um, so I think it's a big problem. I don't have a good answer. I mean, you know, let's do this and everything is going to work out. Um, but I definitely think that um, critical points of view need to be expressed in the academy um, while also understanding that in some places at some times this might be dangerous to the job. That's the problem. Um, not a good answer to your question, but yeah. Thanks for a very provocative talk. Um, I, I think you can answer this question in the affirmative if one looks at the founding documents of, um, of political uh, writers and economic writers in the 17th century, or for example, Adam Smith. He makes yeah. it quite clear that um, the basis of market society is one explicitly by avoiding any talk of virtue and vice. Mm -hmm. And so that market society is structurally built on ignoring use value or what you will call the gendered or invisible part of the economy. But I have a question. Um, I, I think that's vice. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. It's not ignoring. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but I have a, a question. It seemed at the end when you were talking about the responsibility of corporations, that the linchpin in that argument is the legal status of the corporation. That is to say, if you look at the political landscape, and, you, and, and, and this is the case, that uh, those who make up the polis, the US uh, political space, is composed of individuals, some who are legal individuals and others who are natural, some who are mortal and others immortal. It seems to me an extraordinary you know, leap of faith to imagine that the, the answer lies in the direction of corporate social responsibility as opposed to delegitimizing corporate individuality. And that is a question. Well, I would agree with you absolutely. I, I don't think that the, um, all these efforts for corporate social responsibility um, will come to anything in terms of social responsibility. Um, I think that outside, it's outside the corporate structures that the uh, requirements have to be made. So, for example, in the legal system, and the fact that um, they legally, in many places, don't have any responsibility for sustaining life, 
uh, doesn't mean that we couldn't change that responsibility. Corporations are a creation of the society, of the legal system. I don't, I'm not quite sure whether I'm addressing what you, okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, I had a question. Um, you're saying now that today the year's been a diversion between production and human reproduction mm -hmm. as it stands today. But isn't it true that in agrarian societies that the reason that there was such a focus on human reproduction and large families and the sustaining of human life is because the accumulation of economic capital was through the family? Well, I think that, I think that's true that often um, in, many, in many communities, let's say, um, wealth was whatever um, surplus there was, was located within families. And that is still true in many places today. Um, so the this differentiation between production so, and reproduction so that now we have a production system that is not producing for sustaining people is a historical development. It's not that it's always existed. And it's not that those other societies were utopias either, okay, for women or for children, etc. But this is the particular form that historically has developed, and it took quite a long time for this to develop. Um, well, you all know, you've all studied history, and you know when the population moved uh, from being primarily an agricultural population in the United States to being a wage-working population, and that's not so long ago, okay? Now, does that address your question? What's your question? What? Can I add a little to that? Okay. Um, and then I have my next question addendum to that is that even in less developed countries today, the birth rate has dropped a lot because of birth control and other incentives. And they, they don't really rely so much on the wage payroll. So I'm just wondering, um, how do you explain that in response to your question? I'm not sure what the question is, except that um, let's say that uh, the International Labor Office says that one half of the working adults in the, in the world do not have regular employment. All right? They are either in what's known as the uh, informal economy, uh, or they are working in self-sustaining agriculture, or some other kind of work that is not wage labor for uh, capitalist organizations. So is that what you're referring to? They, they are working and um, um, probably not, undoubtedly not as much in agriculture as in previous times. But in addition, I think my theory is that women reduce their fertility whenever they can as long as it, there is no economic incentive or economic imperative, let's say, to have lots of kids to maintain life. So we see birth rates dropping everywhere. I'm not worried at all about infertility. I think that's one of the great tools that women actually have to uh, improve their lives and uh, influence their societies. Um, One of the um, one of the things that a lot of research has documented is that in capitalist firms and in many other non-capitalist workplaces, um, there's been a long history of discrimination uh, in the sense of both using race and using class among workers uh, to situate different kinds of workers in different parts of the labor force. Uh, not necessarily based on their individual preferences, but based on the preferences of, of, a, of, a, of a manager, of an owner of a company. 
do you think that discrimination itself is a, uh, an example of non-responsibility? Um, and is it an example of one of the problems of uh, that capitalism has had in terms of ethics? Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with you. I guess I so much assumed that that I didn't put it on any list of problems, except, except affirmative action as a, a way of dealing with that. And there are other ways of dealing with it. Uh, but certainly, um, it is a, um, it's a complex kind of problem. Uh, certain workers are preferred for certain kinds of jobs, and women are very often, particularly uneducated women, are very often preferred for jobs that um, are routine, as we all know, uh, in which there are high levels of control over the workers uh, and so forth. Um, so, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular study now, Hossfeld's study of uh, computer production in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, in which uh, uh, this, this is when they were still producing computers in Silicon Valley, and they don't anymore. Um, they, uh, the employer hired only South Asian immigrant women, and probably some of them were undocumented. They refused to hire any uh, American, uh, African Americans, and they refused to hire any white people in these jobs. Evidently, they really preferred uh, these women, many of whom could not even speak very much English, and who are highly dependent on these jobs to, to support their children. All of the administrative staff and office staff were white, but only white women were clerical workers and all the managers were white men. And it's just, for me, it's, that has always been a wonderful example of discrimination, even against a lot of Americans who would have liked to have had who were unemployed and looking for jobs in favor of a, a highly controlled workforce. So yes, I think it's a, uh, uh, that discrimination is an incredible uh, problem. And um, it is very subtly done now. And in different patterns for different groups of people. So, uh, one of the big problems I, I see is that young black men are having a hell of a time finding jobs. And it's discrimination in many, many cases. And it's a, so it, it's a problem that has to be addressed on a lot of levels. And thanks for bringing it up, Sandy, because it's, yeah, it's non-responsibility. I guess I should. Um, you were talking about um, non-responsibility and having people's labor be be val valued and not feeling like it's dispensable. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I go into, if I go to Walmart or some similar place, I'm seeing like low-wage jobs being replaced by technology, by machines, and people having their jobs replaced by machines. And I was just wondering what you thought about the ethics of technology replacing low-wage jobs in, in favor of capitalism, I guess, making more money and not having to pay those people, give them benefits. Um, I have a couple comments to that. One is that, uh, of course, technology and, and uh, offshoring are affecting high-wage jobs also, as you all know. And uh, so it's not just low-wage jobs. But I, in a way, that it's a positive thing to have some things that are very uh, routine or harmful to the body or whatever, work like that, replaced by machines. But then you have to figure out how the wealth of the world is going to be distributed. And there has to be some new method of distribution. I'm not uh, suggesting we go back to the 1970s, but I do remember how all kinds of scenarios were being put forth 
during those heady days of the new left, et cetera, uh, for how dis distributive schemes could be uh, invented. And one of them was not really um, like, well, one of them was a universal income to everybody. That would be a living wage, a basic living wage. And then people can do what they want to on top of that to earn more money if they wish, or they can be a painter or um, do crossword puzzles or whatever. There were other schemes that said, well, our whole world is so productive now. We produce far more than all the people on the whole planet need. What we could do is reduce the workday everywhere for everybody. Say, let's have a three-day work day, work week, with a six-hour day and pay the same thing that's being paid now and distribute the work uh, over all the people of the world. Why not do it that way? So everybody works, but everybody works less and everybody has a lot more time to devote to other things than working for money. So there could be lots of different distributive schemes that would take full advantage of the tremendous technology that we have developed that makes our productivity so high. Uh, and uh, still allow the provisioning of everybody. So these are just real utopian dreams now. But some of these kinds of schemes, I mean, it's, it's possible. Yeah, it, um, from your earlier comments, it sounds like you have a lot of experience uh, with Europe as well. And of course, there's a, a variety of examples in Europe. I was wondering how you would answer that question for different European experiences. And more concretely, is there a certain threshold that you see that we go where capitalism can be ethical um, based on those experiences? Uh, I think that all of our predictions are very chancy, you know. Uh, uh, so I wouldn't make any kind of predictions. What I see, at least in um, the places that I know best in Europe, the places I go most are Germany and the Scandinavian countries, and sometimes to England. And I would put England off in a different category. Uh, but it, what they claim, anyway, in, let's take Sweden, which I know better than any place, is that they have been able to achieve a high degree of labor flexibility while at the same time maintaining the social safety net, which is a real social safety net. It's not one that it reduces you to a sub-poverty uh, level of living. Uh, and I think they have done that. However, one of the problems is that Sometimes there are not enough jobs for young people to bring them into the labor force. And that people who, have, who are older, who have lost their jobs, let's say because of technological change of some kind, have a hell of a time getting back into the labor force and feel rather excluded from society, uh, feel alienated because they are not part of what's going on, even though they do have an income. I think that is very much better than what we have here. But it's not a perfect solution. But I think it is also evidence, as I said earlier, that it's possible for capitalism to coexist with a system of social supports uh, that um, makes living possible for people, or let's say much more viable than, than it is where you do not have those social supports. Whether a new kind of capitalism might evolve out of that with built-in um, mechanisms, such as I was just discussing, let's say a three-hour, uh, a three-day week, everywhere. Um, I don't know. Yeah, possible to say. Yeah. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your statement that. Um, cutting the social safety net helps facilitate corporate non-responsibility. 
Yeah, I study uh, the welfare state and uh, welfare restructuring also from a historical perspective, and I can see clear benefits to um, the restructuring that went on for corporations, giving them a larger low-paid labor force, but forcing people into the labor market, also providing contracts for you know, the privatization of welfare services. Mm -hmm. But I can also see that at least today, neoliberal capitalism might also be struggling um, and that the cutting back of social safety nets um, might not be good for them. I mean, in particular, I'm thinking about health care and big giant corporations now, you know, freighted, mm -hmm. weighted down by the burdens of their health care costs now clamoring for the government to actually provide more in the way of social safety mm -hmm. nets. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that relationship there between non-responsibility and cutting the social safety net. Yeah, well, of course, we've never really had much of a social, we've had some social safety net in health care for certain categories of people, let's say, for the elderly um, and for the very poor, uh, which function, well, I think Medicare functions quite well and would serve as a model for a new system. Um, but I think that the health care crisis is an example of a crisis that is pushing businesses, corporations, to support some kind of a new health care system that is more socially responsible. And of course that's because they, because of the particular settlement after World War II when American corporations, the big ones, took over a lot of these social safety net functions. Uh, they can't afford that anymore uh, given uh, the globalization of capital. And so it's very much in their interest now to support that kind of a change. Um, I don't think they are supporting increasing, well, they're not supporting a Medicare model for a national health system in the United States. No, they're p supporting a private sector, uh, primarily medical care system funded buy some public money. They don't want to get rid of the insurance companies. No. Or the HMOs. Um, I don't see them, uh, that is corporations, in the forefront to make unemployment compensation more adequate. Now there still are some programs for unemployment compensation for people whose jobs have been lost because of uh, foreign uh, competition or something like that. These are not very adequate. Um, it is more and more difficult to get unemployment compensation. It's less and less adequate. Uh, most low paid jobs do not have unemployment compensation. Employers are not moving on that because it doesn't cost them anything. So I think it's a question of what are their interests in terms of uh, their own operation, if that speaks to your question. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I'd like to revisit an earlier point and just throw out some other possibilities as to um, why the United States would not adopt a system similar to, let's say, Scandinavia, or I lived in the Netherlands for four years, so I'm just gonna talk specifically about the Netherlands. And uh, besides the fact that they have a social welfare program that seems to work, um, they have also decriminalized certain uh, markets and are profiting off of them. For instance, certain aspects of the sex work industry have been legalized. Hashish and marijuana are tolerated. And there are huge profits at those clubs where marijuana and hashish are, are tolerated. And the sex work industry in Holland does bring in quite a bit of money. And of course, the sex workers are um, taken care of better than if they were just on the streets alone. So they're getting some profits from those particular decriminalized markets. And so I'm just wondering, are there other things besides just corporate greed that prevents the United States from doing similar kinds of things 
um, and decriminalizing certain markets where there, that, where there could also be profits, but that it's ethical in the sense of um, these sex workers are treated better. Since they're going to always be Johns, then why don't we make a profit off of it and protect the women who are going to um, sell their bodies for profit? So I mean, I'm just wondering, what are some of the other things besides corporate greed? Because there's certainly other markets and certainly other ways of supporting a social welfare uh, system in this country that aren't being considered or at least are always put down. Oh, so okay. So you're saying that that maybe if uh, 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 there would be certain social supports for prostitution in the United States, for example, and the, the, those enterprises then could be taxed, that uh, that would contribute to, or let's say we decriminalize drug use yes. and instead tax the tax the business. Um, but it's certainly what Holland's doing. Now, of yeah. course, it's a very small country. So another thing about these Scandinavian countries and countries like Holland is that they're small. They're typically homogeneous. They are becoming more, more people of color are going to those places, yeah. but they have very straightforward kinds of um, homogeneous issues more so than the United States. Well, let me, let me make a couple of com comments, mostly on Sweden, because I don't know the Netherlands that well. Um, and that is that um, Sweden has, at least since immediate post-war, World War II, had a lot of non-ethnic Swedes there. And they have had, however, a national ideology that we are all the same. Okay. <laughs> they haven't been all the same, as a matter of fact. Um, but the, that population has been small enough that uh, there was no problem. Uh, at that, as they had no voice until very recently. In the same now, in Holland with the Suriname. Yeah, yes. right. Mm -hmm. um, but in regard to the United States, I think that uh, one of the reasons we are do not have welfare states uh, of the same kind that they have in mostly Northern Europe uh, is that we had slavery. Yes. And that it too. was a tremendous political problem uh, between the North and the South following slavery, that the uh, efforts to enact welfare benefits, various kinds of things like the Social Security Act, were very much affected by the consequences of slavery. That is, the Southern senators did not want to support anything that would give um, benefits to blacks living in the South. And um, um, I mean, that's an oversimplification. But I think that our history and the importance of history, of slavery in our history, is really critical in understanding why we're so different than some of those other countries. Exactly. And in those other countries, would you agree that their history of colonialism is catching up with them as these other non-ethnic groups who they colonize come to their the, the so-called mother country to claim those benefits? Oh, yeah. They're, they're coping with great problems right now of, of discrimination and racism and, and so forth. Uh, there's just, a, yeah, there's, there's no question about it. Um, I wonder, too, if the effects of World War II aren't part of the picture. All of those countries were so disrupted and many of them almost destroyed in terms of the physical uh, the cities, the towns, etc., by World War II, that they were almost restructured after World War II. And um, at least according to Tony Jute, whose work, whose big book called Post War, I'm now reading, and I'm not all the way through it, but he claims that uh, um, ethnic and racial homogeneity was established post World War II with the movement of populations. And this was mostly ethnic because there were not many, you know, there were not many people of color there at all. And, but that populations were moved after World War II uh, by the victorious side. And of course, with their 
with many much agreement. So Poles were moved out of certain areas, Germans were moved out of others, and Romanians and Bulgarians and etc., creating many, many ethnically um, rather homogeneous enclaves. So that that might have something to do with um, the history also. But um, yeah, it's hard to live in other countries, uh, wealthy countries, and realize what could be, and then face what we have or don't have here. I just want to say one other thing about the about drugs. Um, why? Uh, I think it's really an interesting question why we do not decriminalize the drug trade here in the United States. Um, of course, there are a lot of moral, ethical uh, arguments about it, um, but uh, there are also the very good arguments that um, decriminalizing reduces a lot of the problems attached to it. And um, I wonder if um, there aren't all kinds of networks of profit. It's extraordinarily profitable here. Um, networks of profit that go right into people with a lot of influence. Um, capitalist networks of profit. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one last question. I did want to, to raise one other point about this comparison. Um, while those countries that you're talking about, as you well know, are capitalist, they're, the degree to which their wealth and income inequality, th their wealth and income inequality ratios are very different from ours, so that the concentration of wealth among the wealthy in the United States is far greater than in these other countries. And the ratio of CEO pay to worker pay is, it's so much less in Japan, Sweden, Germany, England, et cetera. So that I think part of American exceptionalism is we're not just capitalism here, we're super capitalism almost. And so, and then I, uh, I could go on and on about taxes, which I won't, because I did that in December. But I do think that, that that's a, a whole, no I mean, the why on that, I don't necessarily know the answer to. But it does create a very different environment in terms of many of the issues you were talking about. I, I would just like to say that one of the uh, reasons, I believe, is the um, strength of labor unions. And so the fact that in some of these countries, social democratic parties, which are uh, very, very tightly interwoven with the labor movement, uh, social democratic parties have been in power for various periods of time. Uh, they have enacted laws, regulations of how wages are set and, and so forth, and tax uh, uh, provisions that tend to equalize wages. The gaps have got, inequality has gotten greater in Europe, um, but nothing like. Ah. Oh, that's yours, okay. <laughs> 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 well, you've given us a ton to think about. Please join us in thanking Professor Acker for her talk.